الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وأسك الله سبحانه وتعالى that he gives us fiqh of his religion and that he teaches the ta'wil of his book likewise we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us firm upon Islam until we meet him this is our fifth session where we are looking at the book Fiqh Al-Ibadat by Sheikh Muhammad and Isra al-Muthaymeen and in today's session inshallah we're going to be looking at some of the rulings concerning at taraweeh at tahajjud and itikaf before we start looking at what the Sheikh was asked in uh, the questions that we have for today it's important for us to understand that the Muslim that is fasting in Ramadan, the Muslim that is experiencing Ramadan, is going through a transformation of Iman that perhaps he doesn't get in any other part of his life, in any other part of the year. And if a person was to inspect, they will see that all five pillars of Islam are found in Ramadan. And if a person was to inspect, they will find all six pillars of Iman found in Ramadan. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked by Jibreel alayhi salam, Akhbirni al-Islam, tell me what is Islam. And he tells him, this is a hadith in Sahih Muslim, the five pillars. Shahada, Salat inside Ramadan, Zakat inside Ramadan, Siyam, and Hajj making Umrah. So then Jibreel alayhi salam asks him, Akhbirni al-Iman, tell me what is Iman. So he tells him the six pillars. Tu'minam billah. Belief in Allah, how many times do you find the Messenger of Allah وسلم, saying, Iman wa ihtisab. Do this, Iman ihtisab. Do that, Iman ihtisab in Ramadan. And what happens? All of your sins are forgiven. Belief in Allah. Belief in the angels. The angels accompany the believer from the beginning of Ramadan to the end of Ramadan throughout his fast, throughout the days, throughout the night constantly making dua for the believer but on the night of Qadr Salamun here had time at Layl Fajr the ulama of Tafsir have said the Malaika they descend upon the people that are worshipping Allah and they bring Salam from Allah until Fajr that's the meaning Salamun here had time meaning the Malaika Bring salam from Allah. Presence of the Malaika. Shahr Ramadan in the Unzila fihi al Quran. Iman in the books. Iman in the Prophets. Dahaq, Rahimahullah, Al Hasr al Basri, and others from the Salaf have said, Ma min nabiyin, there's never been a Nabi illa Sam Ramadan, except that he fasted Ramadan. Min Nuh illa Mandun. Dahaq said, Rahimahullah, from the time of Nuh. It has been legislated. And this is what we find in the book of Allah. Qutiba alaykum as Kama qutiba ala nadeemakum. The prophets that came before you. Iman bil rusul. Iman bil yawm al-akhir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us la'allakum tattakoon. This is the purpose of you fasting. So that you can attain a level of consciousness and accountability in the month of Ramadan. And Qadr, the good of it and the bad, there's a whole surah in the Quran which is called Surah Al Qadr, which is talking about Ramadan. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil Qadr. Therefore, the Muslim who is inside the month of Ramadan, whether they understand it, whether they don't understand it, whether they perceive the things that are happening, a lot of it you can't perceive, a lot of it's happening from the unseen. And Barakah and Rahmah is descending upon the Muslim Ummah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his favor. Islam and Iman is being revitalized in the person who is fasting and experiencing Ramadan in like no way other. <coughs> and this is now the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al baliqa It's clear for you now that this thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated is nothing but goodness for you. Islam externally and Iman internally. Therefore here we are talking about Salat al Tarawih. Don't think of it of a night prayer that I'm going to come, I'm going to sacrifice some sleep, pray with the Imam and go to sleep. No. 
This is from the very essence of what we were just talking about, a salat. A salat is iman, as the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah have said. Salat is the second pillar. And salat comprises of all of the six things that we've just talked about when it comes to the unseen. In actual fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connects the reward that everybody that is seeking ourselves here, which is the reward of Jannah to a salat. قَدْ أَفْلَهَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ the very first characteristic after Iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they establish their salah with khushu. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, وَالَّذِينَهُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَوَاتِهِمْ جَحَافِذُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ They are the ones that will inherit. Inherit what? الَّذِينَ يَرِيثُونَ فِرْدَوْسٌ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ They will inherit Firdaus and they will stay in there forever. Salah connected to Iman, Salah connected to Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the characteristics of humans. Humans. Humans are a despicable creation. And this is not me saying it. Inna al insana khulika halu'a. Man has been created halu'a. What is halu'a? Ida masahu shamu jazu'a. Wa ida masahu khayru manu'a. If something bad happens to him, it is like the whole world has come down upon him. Can't handle it. Becomes foul, becomes wretched. If something good happens, it becomes stingy. Now, this is mine. I'm not sharing it with anyone. Characteristic from your Lord, the one who created insan, he says, This is how insan is. Except for the people who are purifying. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a list of those people who are not halua. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says again, those people who are constantly on their salat. Alladheena wa salatihim da'iun. Constantly. Constantly. Morning, evening. Any break in between. Any nawafil. Ula'ika fi jannatim mukramun. Then what does Allah say in the first ayah? We've seen that they inherited firdos. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, they are in jannat mukramun. Nobility is given to these people. People of who? People of Salat. And if you expect, I mean, I don't want to make it lengthier than we already have. If you look at the position of Salat in this religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it a great deal of importance. The first thing that you will be accountable for is your Salat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tells us that the days alternate from night to day, night to day. Night and day alternate. Why? For those people who want to ponder on the Tawheed of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alternates the day and the night for those people who want to give shukr. How can you give shukr through the alternation of the day and night? Salat. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the hours the days and the night for what? for the salah for the Muslim therefore when we are talking about salat al-taraweeh when we are talking about salat al-tahajjud we are not talking about something which is trivial we are talking about something which is important in your life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated in Ramadan because of that importance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to attain in the month of Ramadan therefore you carry this outside the month of Ramadan and this becomes part of you now the Shaykh has asked, Rahimahullah, what is an act of worship that I can do to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan? And the Shaykh answers by saying, at night time, at taraweeh. What is at taraweeh? Now the Shaykh benefits us in the very first answer, in the very first part of his answer. At taraweeh, huwa al qiyam. Some people think that Taraweeh is different to Qiyam al-Layl, is different to Tahajjud. The Shaykh is saying here, at Taraweeh is Qiyam. Tahajjud is Taraweeh. Taraweeh is Qiyam al-Layl. Qiyam al-Layl is Tahajjud. They're all the same thing. And he even uses as evidence the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is Bukhari Muslim authority of Hurayra. Man qama Ramadan. Whoever makes Qiyam in Ramadan. When do you make Qiyam in Ramadan? Taraweeh. This is what normal people call Taraweeh. But the Messenger of Allah uses the word Qiyam. 
Man qama Ramadan iman wa ihtisab Ghufir lahum an tuqadr Anyone who stands Ramadan And what the ulama have mentioned here Meaning you stand all of it or most of it With iman and ihtisab Iman meaning you seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala His pleasure and his reward And ihtisab remaining uh, steadfast on it Not giving it up If a person remains persistent all of his previous sins will be forgiven. And some of the ulama have said here, it's not just a sin, but it's the trace of the sin, it's the record of the sin, it's the inclination towards that sin. And this is the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sumiyat al-tarawih is called a tarawih because people, they rest whilst they are praying. Istirahu qalilan tumistanafu. They pray too. Or well, they pray for, and they rest, and then they pray for, and then they rest. Hence it is called a taraweeh. But essentially, there is no difference between any of the night prayers that we've just mentioned. What's the evidence for a taraweeh? Aisha radiallahu anha in this hadith that the Shaykh is mentioning here in Bukhari and Muslim. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can in the peace of Allah sallam yusalli arba'an. He used to pray four raka'at. فَلَا تَسْأَلُنَّ عَنْ Do not ask about its beauty and its length. ثُمَّ يُسَلِّ أَرْبَعًا Then he prayed another four. فَلَا تَسْأَلُنَّ عَنْ Do not ask about its beauty and its length. Now, how do we understand that? Does that mean he prayed four in one go? We know from the statement of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, He said, سَلَاتُ اللَّيْلِ مَثْنَى مَثْنَى A night prayer is done in twos. Therefore, Aisha radiallahu anha, her statement here, as been mentioned by Ibn Hajar and Nawi and others from the ulama, is that he prayed two long ones, beautiful ones, beautiful and lengthy in its recitation, in its ruku, in its sujood. Then he prayed another two, and then he rested for a little while. And then he prayed two, and then he prayed two. So he's praying four, uh, he's praying two by two, and resting after every four. Now with this, I want to use this opportunity. I mean, this is the issue of ishtihad. But the ulama have said that these four that you would pray, these two units that you would pray, that is the night prayer. The isha is not the night prayer. The shafa' and the witr is not the night prayer. The night prayer are the two units that you would pray, making them lengthy. And here's the evidence. Because Aisha radiallahu anha said, he prayed four in Allah. Don't ask how long they were and how beautiful four they were. Then he prayed another four. Don't ask how long they were and how beautiful. Thumma yusalli thalath. And then he prayed three raka'at. And those three raka'at are not like the other four. Meaning they were just normal three raka'at. With this the ulama have said. And I remember our Shaykh Shaykh Saad al-Shathri was asked this question. But it's not just him. This from the ulama. They were asked. Can we make the khatma of the Qur'an in the masjid. Can we include that in our Salat al-Isha? So when the Imam stands for Isha, and perhaps even in some masjids they pray in Fajr as well, part of the khatma that they want to complete the Qur'an, they have a little bit and they put it in Fajr, and they have a little bit and they put it in Isha. And included in the Witr as well. So instead of having two and one, they will pray two and two and two and two and two and two and, two and just pray one Witr after. The ulama have said that this is not part of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah as you can see in this hadith. Because the night prayer is the four that Aisha radiallahu anha said that he made beautiful. And then the other four that he made beautiful. And the witr and the shaf, that is not part of uh, what should be part of you know, making it lengthy. And I remember our Shaykh saying, Khairul Hadi Hadi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In actual fact, a person made Salat al Isha lengthy at the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He recited Surah Baqarah. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, Tafatan, in some narrations, he came onto the member and he was angry and he said, Inna min kum mufirun. There are people who are turning people away from the masjid. You're making Salat al Isha too lengthy. And then he told the Imam who made the recitation long for Salat al-Isha we're talking about 
recites a bihisma, recites a shamsi, one lady, one duha, make it easy for people. Therefore, this statement here of Aisha radiallahu anha is very important. There's a great deal of fiqh, which is that the night prayer is the prayer that we are doing two by two by two by two. One you have finished, then it is recommended for you to pray two rakat shafa. And the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in this is to do sabbih and kafirun and qul hu Allah wahad. Some of the ulama, such as the Maliki, have said you do qul hu Allah wahad for like I mean, the issue is flexible, but what there is agreement in is that that shaf'an is not part of the lengthiness that you would have in taraweeh and tahajjud. That is separate. So the Shaykh is saying here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi prayed uh, this night prayer. And this is an establishment for us in the Sunnah that there is a night prayer. So then the Shaykh is going on and talking about then what about us praying in congregation? The Messenger of Allah وسلم, left us a precedence in that also. He prayed three nights in a row and then he stopped and he said, Inni khashitu an alaykum. I fear that this would then become mandatory upon you. Therefore, the essence can be found in the Sunnah. This is very important. People think that anything that the Messenger of Allah didn't habitually do would be an innovation. Innovation is something that the Messenger of Allah didn't do, the Khulafa didn't do, the Salaf didn't do. And this has been a, a loose definition given by a Shatibi and Itisam, Rahimullah. Anything which is not found from the Messenger of Allah and from the generations that came before. So if a person introduces something new into the religion and says this is part of the sharia and this is part of the religion and if you do it you'll be rewarded this is what you have to go back to. So a person will then try and use and this has been done before where they say look this is an example of good innovation. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, he didn't pray in the masjid throughout the whole month. He didn't pray 20 rakat. He didn't complete the Quran in Salat al-Taraweeh. This is proof for us that we can have good innovation. If we can have good innovation, that we can practice the celebration of the Prophet's birthday. And what else you might want to add to that? This is a misunderstanding in Usul al Fiqh, and this is a misunderstanding on how and what innovation is. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, established for us the precedence. And if the precedence is there, especially from the time of the Salaf, then it is not an innovation. The Shaykh has then asked. Uh, a couple of questions where he's talking about some common mistakes that occur during Salat al-Taraweeh. Uh, the question is asking, can you give us some pointers about some of the mistakes that could happen during Salat al-Taraweeh? Uh, and he actually has asked this question a few times, so I'm going to try and put it all together. So he says, Rahimahullah, one of the biggest mistakes that happens, and this is still evident today, you don't need to go far to see it, that you find many of the imma of the masajid hastening through the salat at speed, reciting the Qur'an in a manner that doesn't befit the Qur'an to be recited in, and making ruku in a manner that doesn't befit, and making sujood in a manner that doesn't befit. In actual fact, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described the sujood of a munafiq as if it is a bird pecking on the floor. Allah Musta'an. So the Shaykh is saying here, فَكَثِيرٌ مِنَ الْأَيْمَّةِ يُسْرَعْ فِي الْتِرَوِي إِسْرَاءٍ عَذِيمًا They run through the tarawi. I've even heard of a masjid that does 20 rak'at with, with, with Isha in 45 minutes. And that's a full juz. How is that possible? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So the Shaykh is saying here, hastening. Hastening beyond what is beyond the bounds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأُرْتِلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Recite the Qur'an. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> At a measured pace. Right, uh, another thing that the Shaykh uh, mentions is that the, uh, you will find some of the imma making the kunut lengthy. 
And the Shaykh is saying here, this is not found from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Umar radiallahu anh combined the companions together to lead them in, uh, uh, in Salat al-Tarawih, Ubay bin Ka'b and Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhum. The recitation was lengthy to the extent that it's been narrated that he used to come to the masjid with sticks. People used to come to the masjid with sticks. Imagine if you saw that today. Imagine on the streets people are coming with walking sticks to the masjid. Young men with walking. Why would they come with walking sticks? This is how lengthy the recitation was. The companions, they used to come for Salat al with sticks so that they wouldn't fall over. What have they left behind for us as a precedent? May Allah make us of them and unite us with them even though our deeds have not met theirs. The recitation was lengthy but the dua qunut was not that lengthy to the extent that Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, was asked how long should the qunut be? He said it shouldn't be longer than wassama'i wa tariq how long it takes for you to recite with Sama Tariq, which is not long. That's how it should be. To the extent that some of the ulama from the Salaf have said that there is no Qunut. And Qunut should be done if you're doing it personally for yourself, but in the congregation there is no evidence for it according to some of the Salaf. I mean, whatever the case, the Shaykh is saying here, I mean, the issue is flexible. Because again, like we've said, we've got a precedence. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, taught Imam Hussein and others from the company. Umar and also established Qunut. <coughs> Therefore, there is a precedence, and nobody can say it is an innovation. However, the Sheikh is saying here, lengthy qunut is from the mistakes of the aim. Then the Sheikh says that there are some mistakes that you find from the people who are following the aim. And he said that there are two common ones. Number one, you will find some people, instead of listening to the recitation, they will open up their phone or the mushaf and follow what the imam is doing. Now, this is makruh with all the madahib. In actual fact, the Hanafis say that your salah will be invalid because you are not praying anymore, you are reading. For me, not the correct opinion. However, undoubtedly, behind the imam, there is no need for a person to read. You can listen, and this is what the Quran is being recited for you. On top of that, the Thaymeen, Rahimullah, is saying that when you're carrying the Quran, it's going to disturb people next to you. When you're carrying the Qur'an, it's going to affect the ability to make Ruku and Sujood correctly. Therefore, it is makroo uh, for a person to hold anything behind the Imam. <coughs> there could be a question, is that if I am the Imam, or if I'm praying by myself, then that's something which is separate. Which is not what the Shaykh is talking about, so we'll leave that for another time. The second thing that the Shaykh is saying here is that you find some people breaking the sufuf and leaving and not completing the salah with the imam. And the shaykh is saying here that this is a great loss. It's a loss for the person who is leaving. This is a great loss because the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Man qama ma imam hatta yansarif, kutiba lahu qiyam al-layla. Fayafutuhu al-ajr al A great deal of reward has been completely put aside by this person in Ramadan could be later to Qadr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by these nights waliyalin ashur there is nothing like these ten nights not in your life but then he turns away from this hadith where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said if you only had finished with the imam you would have been rewarded for the whole night the Shaykh is saying here, for your a great deal of reward for what? For what purpose? Now, we're not trying to be harsh with people. Obviously, people have things to do, people haven't got work to go to, etc. But the Shaykh is saying here, if a person leaves and he is wasting his time, then that person surely, you know, has missed a great deal of reward. Uh, the Shaykh is then asked about some of the mistakes concerning crying. Is it permissible for a person to cry in Salah? Now this is again a very important issue that sometimes people might take lightly. If a person, and there is no disagreement between the fuqaha on this either from the former dahib. If a person cries in the Salah, making himself cry, forcing himself to cry, sometimes he might even think about something which is sad to make himself cry. The ulama have said that that person's Salah is invalid. 
because he is doing an action which is not befitting the salah. The purpose of the salah is not that you cry within it. However, the discussion now is if you are overcome by emotions and you begin to cry, just like you are overcome by sneezing or coughing or something of that manner, then there is no harm and you carry on. To the extent that some of the ulama, and you'll find this in the books of the Hanabila, have said that if a person is crying a great deal or coughing a great deal or something like that, it's actually recommended for him now to go into ruku so that the people behind or people next to him are not disturbed. So you have over, been overcome by this emotion of crying. This happens. This is the book of Allah. This is the, the strength of it. But what do you do? Do you carry on in that manner so that the purpose is that everybody else starts crying? That is not the purpose. That is categorically not the purpose. Therefore, the Sheikh is saying here, you will find some people uh, crying and going into length of this, etc. And the Sheikh is saying here, وَيَكُونُ فِيهَا مَشَّقَّةٌ الْمُسَلِّينَ وَبَعْنُهُمْ And then he goes on to talk about why it shouldn't be there. Next question, and this is the last one, it comes to Taraweeh and Tahajjud. And this is a very important question. فَضِيلَةُ الشَّيْخِ بَعْدِ النَّاسِ يَحْيُونَ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالْعِبَادَةِ وَلَا يَحْيُونَ غَيْرَهَا فِي رَمَضَانِ some people, when they think it is Laylatul Qadr, so tonight is the 23rd, the day after will be 25th, then 27th. The Shaykh has asked this question here. Some people, when they think it's an odd night, when they think it's going to be Laylatul Qadr, that's the only time when you find them standing and worshipping Allah. No, I understand. But the even nights, I don't know, they're relaxed, maybe they're on their phones, maybe they're going to sleep. The Shaykh is saying here, La. This is not correct. Laylatul Qadr could be any one of these nights. It could be the 27th, it could be 25th, it could be an even, it could be an odd. Yes, the Messenger of Allah told us to seek it in the odd nights. But what is an odd night? Some of the ulama of the Sadaf have said odd nights could actually be an even night according to the way you think of it, but it's actually an odd night. What do we mean by that? Okay, so the 21st is an odd night. 21 is an odd number, fair enough. 22, is that an odd night or is that an even night? Now, a lot of people, as the Sheikh is pointing out here, will become then relaxed on the 22nd, thinking it's even, it's not important. The Messenger of Allah said, seeking the last seven, seeking the odd. 27 is not that important. 22nd is not that important, sorry. But some of the ulama, some of the ulama from the Salaf have said, 22nd night is actually nine nights remaining. So it becomes an odd night in the way the amount of nights that remain. 23 tonight is an odd night. 24, seven nights remaining. In actual fact, Laylatul Qadr, when the Messenger of Allah became a Nabi, and when the Quran was revealed, was on the 24th of that year, which is an even night, and so forth. So the Shaykh is saying here, this is a a terrible misconception that people have in actual fact the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the messenger of Allah sallallahu throughout their whole 10 as Aisha radiallahu anha said when the 10 began he exerted himself and in the messenger of Allah sallallahu is your example not just the odd nights every single one of them now we have some questions when it comes to itikaf now itikaf is pretty straightforward uh, what is itikaf? The Shaykh is saying itikaf is the human insan masjid in the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stay in the masjid. Itikaf is to stay in the masjid. Wa yishtaghim bi ta'at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he spends and he busies his time in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's what he does. That is itikaf. There is nothing really else that needs to be said about that. However, the Shaykh is then asked, uh, okay, where is the itikaf? The itikaf is done in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, but the majority of the ulama have said it can be done outside of Ramadan. It can be done uh, outside of Ramadan because the Messenger of Allah did it in Shawwal one year. And he also told uh, Umar an, to perform the itikaf outside of Ramadan. Where is it done? It is done in the masjid. 
So the Shaykh is asked, where is it tikaf done for men and women? It is only done in the masjid. Some of the ulama from the madhahib, which you will find this in the Hanafi madhab, and some of the ulama of the salaf, they have said it is recommended for a woman to do itikaf in her home. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي masajid." Therefore the majority of the ulama have said that itikaf can only be done in the masjid. What should a person do? What are some of the things which are recommended? And what are some of the things which are permissible for a person to do whilst the person is in itikaf? This is the last question here. So the Sheikh is saying here. I mean, if a person is staying in the masjid, a lot of this is common sense. If you're staying in the masjid, you're going to preserve the etiquettes of the masjid. So if a person is asked, what is wajib upon the muqtakif? what the person is doing in itikaf, then preserve the five daily prayers. Preserve tahara. Preserve jumu'ah. Preserve your fasting. Preserve the house of Allah. Preserve the way you treat one another and don't annoy one another. So all of these things are wajib. And if a person wants to transgress any one of these, then they'll become haram. Common sense. But then what are some of the things which are mustahab? So the Shaykh is saying here, increasing in that which is from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now here's a very important principle. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up the doors of worship so that nobody has an excuse, yawm al qiyamah, to say, oh Allah, I found this too difficult. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِكُلِّ وِجْهَةٍ هُوَ مُوَلِّيهَا Every single one of us have a way of attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it might be different from one person to another. But everyone has a means to attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, when the Shaykh is saying here, do things which are going to be of obedience to Allah, the doors are open. Alhamdulillah, now, in the generation that we live in now, you can be in the masjid and you can give in sadaqah. That didn't exist at the time of the salaf. At the time of the salaf, you'd have to appoint someone physically to take the sadaqah on your behalf. But here you can just press a few buttons and you're doing lots of different acts of worship and you're not even moving. Seeking ilm, reciting Quran, listening to lectures. So the Shaykh is saying here the person must busy himself with that which is in the pleasure of Allah. However, it is very important for us to note whether it's something which is wajib or whether it is something which is mustahab, that which is specific takes precedence over that which is unrestricted. Sorry, that which is specific takes precedence over that which is restricted. Let me give you an example. It's one o'clock. The person is in itikaf. Is it recommended for him now to get up and prepare himself for Salat al-Dhuhr and come to the front saf? Or is it better for him to think, okay, you know what, I've still got 25 minutes. I'll recite some Quran. I'll read something, I'll listen to something, and I'll get up about 20, go do wudu, and even if I pray in the third and fourth stuff, it doesn't matter. Still in the, I'm still in the masjid. Which one is more correct? That which is more specific takes precedence over that which is general. And this is a well known principle you'll find across the books of fiqh. al mutlaq al muqayyid. That which is specific, the front stuff, that which is specific to time, that which is specific to place. This is for itikaf and outside of itikaf. This is just a life lesson. This takes precedence. So the Shaykh is saying here, the person must engage in that which is uh, beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about some of the things which are permissible for the person to do? Now the Shaykh is saying here, it is permissible for you to talk to one another. It is permissible for you to eat, to drink, to groom etc. But this must be done with a balance. And this is similar to what we have just said, that you don't harm other people, that you don't contradict what is wajib, you don't contradict that which is more specific when it comes to the reward of Allah. But if you've got a few minutes here and there, there is no harm in talking, there is no harm in inquiring, there is no harm in you know, seeing if you can help one another, etc. But again, like we have said, it must be balanced. What about things which are not permissible? Now the Shaykh is saying here, it is not permissible for a person to leave the masjid because the itikaf, the whole essence of it is, you, know, you stay in a place. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the people of Musa alayhi salam after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them from Fir'aun they crossed the Red Sea they went, group, they went past a group of people that were worshipping idols Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here he found a group of people they were devoted and they stayed next to their idols so the people of Musa alayhi salam said to Musa Ijlana ilahan kamalahum aliha after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them, after they seen a miracle, they said to Musa, can we have idols that they've got idols? You are a group of people who are ignorant when it comes to the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point here is, i'tikaf means that you devote yourself to a particular place. If a person leaves, then that person has negated the i'tikaf. Now, the best way that I have seen from uh, some of the way that the ulama have explained what is leaving if a person leaves to do something for someone else to do something to fulfill his own desires without a necessity or he goes out when there is no need for him to go out this is what is meant by leaving to do something for someone else. So now imagine there is a janazah and you go to pray the janazah. The itikaf is broken. Why? Because you have left the salah, you have left the itikaf to perform salat al janazah to do something for someone else. To visit the poor, to feed the needy, etc. All of these are good deeds, but you would then break your itikaf by leaving. Leaving for the sake of your own desires. Uh, this is, I think, quite self-explanatory but if a person leaves for his own self to fulfill something for his own self and the shaykh gives examples of you know visiting your family or trade or work or taking a business call etc and you're going outside the market itikaf is broken because you have left the luzum the masjid staying behind in the masjid for the sake of Allah and you have left that for the sake of conducting your own business or he goes out and there is no need for him to go out. So we say to him, Akhi, where are you going? I just feel like going for a walk. That person has broken the itikaf. So the Shaykh is saying here, these are some of the things which would nullify the itikaf. I mean, there are other things that the ulama have mentioned in the books of fiqh as well. Uh, such as if a person... Um, I think we've mentioned what we needed to mention anyway. So these are some of the rulings connected to the itikaf. Inshallah, next week we have a few questions left concerning Zakat al Fitr and the Ahkam uh, connected to Eid. Uh, normally, our session is after Salat al Asr, so we'll return inshallah next Saturday after Salat al Asr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He teaches us of the religion in a manner that He is pleased with us for. Mm-hmm. Likewise, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes us steadfast upon Islam whilst we are sitting and whilst we are standing or wherever we may be. Likewise, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He removes the distress that the Muslim Ummah is currently experiencing. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring ease for the people of Aqsa and that he gives those people who are being oppressive over them for many, many years now. Many, many years. He brings them to justice and that we see the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unfold in front of our eyes. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he opens the Masjid al-Aqsa for the Muslims and that he gives us risk of performing two raka'at in that masjid. Mm-hmm. Likewise, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he facilitates the affair of the people of Sham, of Yemen, and the Rohingya, and the Uyghurs, and whoever is going through any kind of difficulty from the Muslims. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we end Ramadan with his pleasure and his mercy, mm-hmm. and unity and comfort mm-hmm. and ease. Allahu a'lam. Sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thank you.